guys want to okay. just introduce yourself and spell names your names. Names and spellings and titles and all that good, good stuff. Yeah, I'm uh, Bernie Bilski, B-I-L-S-K-I. Rand, R-A-N-D, Rand, R -A -N -D, Warsaw, that'd be A-R-S-A-W. Could you guys tell us in a nutshell what you invented? The, the invention is a guaranteed energy bill, which is like a budget bill without a true-up. And it's a method of hedging both sides in the transaction. So behind giving consumers, energy consumers, a guaranteed energy bill, there's a lot of mechanics. And the mechanics involve financial transactions between energy consumption or any energy consumers and the energy providers. And that's what the invention is in a nutshell. It's a method of generating uh, guaranteed bills for consumers and also protecting energy company earnings. The Bilski case itself is someone applied for a patent on a business method or software and the patent office rejected it. And now this is that person suing the patent office saying you have to grant me that patent. This case is about what does it mean to be a patentable process. And so since software patents fall under the category of processes because they're not the machine, and they're not a composition of matter, which are some of the other categories of things that are patentable, this case will define what it means to be a patentable process. What about Justice Roberts? He said, you know, basically your patent involves people picking up the phone and calling other people. It could be reduced to that level as the certain acts that are performed, but it's much more than that. It has to do with selling a commodity at a fixed price to one party, selling uh, to a different party at a different fixed price, identifying counter risk positions. If you look at claim four in the patent, we have things called claims which describe really what the invention is. There's a long mathematical formula in there that it didn't exist in nature or, or anywhere in the literature that these very inventive folks came up with. Once upon a time, math was not patentable, and now it is. Yeah, and, and we can have somebody like Bilski coming in and saying, yes, uh, you know, I worked hard on this mathematical equation, and therefore I, sh I should have a patent on this information processing method here. You mentioned in your claim that there's a very long calculation shown there. There is. Do you think a strong calculation or good math is a basis for a, for a patent? It can be. The basic process of, of writing software is you take a broad algorithm of some sort, so, you know, some means of doing something with abstract data, and then you, you apply variable names. So for our first derivation, let's start with just a simple matrix, uh, a matrix of values. And we'll, we'll find the mean of each column, mean mu, mu, mu 1, mu 2, mu 3. And we're going to find define y to be x minus x, uh, I'm sorry, x minus mu for each column. Now if we have some, some other vector, x, we can take x dot s and find the projection of x onto this space. This is called a singular value decomposition. Now, here's the trick. Here's the great part. Now, let's say, in, in, let's say this first row, x1, equals uh, sexuality. Let's say x2 equals, uh, do you own cats? And x3 equals, I don't know, uh, affectionateness. OK, so now we'll also say that, that let, let, let's take a vector uh, J1 equals Jane. Jane's responses on this, uh, on this survey. Let's say J2 equals Joe's responses. Now let's do the same projection as we did before. We're going to take X dot, we're going to take J1 dot S. We're going to take, subtract that from J2 dot S. We're going to find the distance between these two points. And we're going to call that compatibility. And in that simple step, we have derived patent number 6,735,568. Uh, the, trick, the trick of our derivation was that before, with the singular value decomposition, we had abstract numbers. What the guys at eHarmony did to get this patent was to assign names to our variables. So instead of just an abstract x1, we have sexuality. Instead of an abstract x2, we have a preference for cats. And by making those assignments, by setting variable names in this manner, they were able to take an abstract concept and turn it into a patentable device. What we want to do, uh, according to the, the, you know, the, the heads of, of our patent institutions, 
is take mathematics and slice it up into as many slices as possible and hand those slices out and say, well, if you do a principal component analysis, if you multiply matrices for, uh, for dating sites, well, OK, you can, we'll give that to eHarmony. Uh, if it's for equities, we'll give that to State Street, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, what we're giving out is basically exclusive rights to use mathematics, to use a law of nature in whatever context. And what we're getting in return is basically nothing. The patents is a government grant in the U.S. It uh, arises out of the Constitution. The framers included the provision for granting in exclusive rights to inventors in our Constitution. And the, the belief was that that was important in order to reward people who had made technological advances that would benefit society. The rights that they are granted are not the rights to do the thing that they, they, they invent, but the, the right to exclude others from doing that thing. So the idea was you have a machine or a thing which is not previously described in any literature and which no skilled mechanic could figure out how to make given what is described in the literature, and for that you get a patent. The, the basis for determining what is patentable subject matter has continued to evolve over the last 200 years of our, our national existence. In 1953, the Patent Act was modified by Congress to add the words or processes to the word product in describing what could be patented. The Congress which did that was plainly thinking about processes of industrial manufacture, processes that produced something at the other end. Float glass on molten tin and it will become flat or whatever. And it's unlikely that anybody thought of process at that time in terms of computer software because we didn't uh, have applications on computer software for uh, many years after the, that uh, the last revision of the Patent Act. Back in the late 70s, the patent law was interpreted such that you couldn't patent software. It was considered a mathematical algorithm, a law of nature. The legal uh, world changed. Uh, the environment was quite different, starting with some, um, some uh, decisions by the Supreme Court, like Diamond v. Deere. The, um, the patent applicant was coming in with a new process for curing rubber. The temperature and the preciseness of the temperature is essential in, in, in curing rubber well. And the innovation that was being patented in this case was, um, was a, a, an algorithm to monitor a thermometer that, that was basically in the process and determined when the rubber needed to be released um, and cooled. And they said processes for curing rubber are patentable. There's nothing new about that. The fact that they use a computer in implementing it shouldn't change anything. The Supreme Court makes it clear that you cannot patent software because it is only a set of instructions or an algorithm. And uh, abstract laws of nature, algorithms are unpatentable in the U.S. itself. And um, however, there is, then there was the creation of the Court uh, of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. The problem being solved in some sense begins with the fact that trial court judges always hate patent cases. And the reason the trial court judges hate patent cases is for a single trial judge, a lawyer who has spent his or her life doing litigation, a patent case in which she or he is going to be required to find detailed facts about how paint is made or how computers work or how radio broadcasting operates is an opportunity just to be made into a fool. Congress is attempting to change the system in which patent cases are litigated. 
But instead of changing who tried patent cases, Congress left the non-specialist district judge in charge of the trial and then created a new court of appeals called the Federal Circuit, whose job it was to hear all appeals from patent cases. Rapidly, of course, this court filled up with patent lawyers. And the patent lawyers then made the law in the Court of Appeals that applied to all those district judges who were still making non-specialist decisions of which they were afraid. Naturally, the Federal Circuit turned out to be a place which loved patents. And its chief judge, Giles Rich, who lived to be very, very old and died in his late 90s, was a man who particularly loved patents on everything. The Federal Circuit Court under Giles Rich sort of broke diamond against deer loose from its original meaning and came to the conclusion that software itself could be patented. The Supreme Court basically left everything to this court to decide. The PTO actually used to reject patents on software like in the early 1990s and they did not allow them and the applicants would appeal those rejections to the Federal Circuit. In the world of machines, you showed the patent office the machine, and you got a patent office whose claims were, I claim this machine. In the world of computer software, there was no way of defining what the unit was. I don't claim a program, I claim a technique that any number of programs doing any number of things could possibly use. The consequence of which is that very rapidly we began to build up as real estate that somebody owned and could exclude other people from a whole lot of basic techniques in computer programming. What happened was, starting in the mid-90s, the, the numbers of patents on software started soaring. Uh, and industry attitudes started changing, too. So you had Microsoft, which originally didn't deal with software patents very much at all. I guess they got sued in the early 90s by Stack and lost a uh, significant judgment against them. They started patenting. They're going to have their own their own set of patents, so that if a major patent holder threatens them, they can fire back. Gradually, companies like Oracle were forced to set up patent departments just for defensive reasons. They had to patent their stuff so that they had something to trade with uh, companies that had patents. And so the arsenals start to develop. And by the two thousand, you know, year two thousand, two thousand one, Microsoft now holds you know, thousands of software patents. Oracle was probably approaching a thousand software patents. Adobe. You know, all of them have become more and more aggressive patenters and some of the ones who were against software patents ended up suing other companies. And, and so you, you, what, you, what you've had is an explosion of patenting first and then an explosion of litigation. By the late 90s, uh, about a quarter of all patents granted were software patents. Uh, about a third of all litigation, patent litigation, involves software patents. About 40% of the cost of litigation is attributable to software patents. And those numbers have been going up. So uh, Charles Freeney invented a, a kiosk that goes in retail stores. Uh, and the idea is you'd come in, you could s select the music selection, swipe your credit card, put in a blank nine-track tape, and this is, this is how long ago this patent was. Uh, and it would write that music selection onto the tape and you could go away with it. Uh, the patent was drafted in a very, you know, this very vague language, so there, was, there were terms like point of sale location and information manufacturing machine. And uh, Freeney uh, eventually sold this patent to somebody who wanted to interpret those terms very broadly. Um, to basically cover e-commerce. Uh, so he, here was this you know, this very limited invention for uh, this kiosk, and he wanted to interpret those terms in such, broad, in such a broad way that it would cover transactions that took place over the internet, that you could, they, they could, be, you could make them in your office, in your bedroom, in your house, uh, anywhere. Uh, and, and so it covered virtually all of e-commerce. Um, 
The courts initially didn't agree with that interpretation, but it, they appealed it, and the appellate court largely agreed with them, uh, and they were able to extract uh, uh, some settlements out of oh, well over 100 companies. Um, but the, the, the significant thing is, he, here is this patent. You can't tell what its boundaries were until you get to the appellate court. What most people thought the, its boundaries were turned out to be wrong. One of the key properties of a programming language is very, very precise. You can look at any, any programming language in any language, you know, any uh, C, Python, or any language like this, and you know exactly what it's doing. And you can say, you can look at two pieces of source code, and you can say, you know, are this doing the same thing or different things? Um, and, and we do this because computers are very picky, and, and we need to uh, tell the computer exactly what we need to do in order to accomplish some task. Um, the, the, patent, uh, the, the language the patent lawyers use is almost the opposite. Um, there's an advantage in being vague and in being broad and being nonspecific because the broader your language, um, the more uh, things you sort of catch in your net. So it is a large problem in our patent system just defining simply what is the context or the borders of the patent. And, you know, what does it cover, what does it not cover? And that ambiguity causes a lot of chilling effects because people are going to avoid doing anything that could possibly be covered by the patent, even if in reality the patent wouldn't cover what they want to do. Let's imagine that in the 1700s, the governments of Europe had decided to promote the progress of symphonic music, or as they thought, promote it, with a system of musical idea patents, meaning that anybody who could describe a new musical idea in words could get a patent, which would be a monopoly on that idea, and then he could sue anybody else that implemented that idea in a piece of music. So a rhythmic pattern could be patented, or uh, a sequence of chords, or uh, a, a set of instruments to use together, or any idea you could describe in words. Now imagine it's 1800, and you're Beethoven, and you want to write a symphony. You're going to find it's harder to write a symphony that you won't get sued for than write a symphony that sounds good. Because to write a symphony and not get sued, you're going to have to thread your way around thousands of musical idea patents. And if you complained about this, saying that this was getting in the way of your creativity, the patent holders would say, oh, Beethoven, you're just jealous because we had these ideas before you. Why should you steal our ideas? People have been making music for, for thousands of years. You know, there, there, were never, there was never any need for patents in the field of music. And since the computer industry has made programming possible. People have been developing software as well for you know, since right since the beginning. There was never a need to have patents in this field in order for the the activity to, to happen. Most everything we were doing back uh, before 1980, before 1981, those things patents played no no role in it. Uh, cut and paste. Um, uh, the, the embedded ruler in word processing, uh, word wrapping, a lot of the things that are real important that we take for granted and that are much, much more innovative in many ways than many patents that we have today, because patents can be on some very, very minute, um, minute things, and that's the way the law works. Um, that, those things happened, and we had great advances without patents. One of the world's most uh, respected computer scientist, Donald Knuth, has said that um, if software patents had been available in the 1960s and 70s when he was doing his work, that it's probably the case that computer science wouldn't be where it is today. Uh, there would be blockades on innovation that could seriously have prevented the kinds of um, technical solutions that we uh, take for granted today. The programmer writing a long program might conceivably need to check whether 500 or 1,000 different techniques are patented, and there's no way that she possibly could. The patent office issues hundreds of software patents all the time. Every Tuesday they issue 3,500 patents, and a large number of those relate to software. It's just impossible to review all those patents every week to make sure you're not doing something that could infringe them. So there's a, um, a provision in the U.S. patent laws that basically holds patent infringers um, at a, I, I guess, imposes greater liability if they're shown to willfully infringe. So basically the idea is that 
if you knew about a patent and you infringed on it, you should have a stricter penalty than if you didn't know about it. But what this results in is the situation where there's a real disincentive to follow what patents have been made and, and you know, what, what new inventions there have been through the patent system. Because if you read every patent, then, or, or there's evidence to show that you've read patents, then you are liable for willful infringement. Then you knew about the patent and you infringed it anyway, and the penalty is treble damages. A number of the um, people who filed briefs in this court suggested that software should be removed from the scope of patentability. Can you comment on that? Yes, well, I obviously disagree with that, and I don't believe that software should ever be removed. It's one of our greatest sources of technical innovation in this country. And to come up with a test that would somehow eliminate software would, I think, be a disaster for the economy. You know, Mike, Mike and I estimate that um, outside of pharmaceuticals and chemicals, the patents sort of are, are acting like a 10 or 20 percent tax. Uh, you know, so you, you can think of that, uh, that, you know, the small developer who's developing something, down the road he's going to have to pay that tax. And, and, you know, every small company I know in, in, in software has... A few, you know, as long as they've been around a few years and and hit the market, uh, somebody is is uh, asserting a patent against them. They're running into some potential difficulties. They feel very frequently feel obligated to get patents themselves for defensive purposes. Uh, so all of that activity is is a tax. It's it's something that's not helping them innovate. Uh, it's it's you know an unnecessary activity. The primary thing we do is. Uh an issue tracking system called RT or request tracker. Mm -hmm. So it's customer service, help desk, bug tracking, network operations, anything where you've got a whole bunch of tasks that need to get kept track of um, and you need to know what happened, what didn't happen, who did it, who didn't do it, when. Um, it's kind of like a to-do list f on steroids f designed for a whole organization. Pretty much everything, everything is open source or free software um, under one license or another. We'll get, you know, we will get consulting customers or support customers who add indemnification language to our, sta to our standard contract or need us to sign theirs, and it says that, you know, you know in the standard legalese, it's going to say something like, uh, we indemnify and hold them harmless and agree to pay their legal fees and sacrifice our firstborn if something happens and someone discovers that our software is, um, is violating a patent, is violating somebody else's patent. It's very, very rarely the case that we end up signing something that has that kind of language in it, but it eats up a lot of legal fees. Look at the innovative people in software, in ICT, and ask, would they be better off if the patent system was abolished? The answer is probably yes. Who's benefiting? Um, patent lawyers, number one. Uh, Number two, you, you have a small number of so-called trolls uh, who, are, who are benefiting, but it's not clear that even most of them make, are making much money. Uh, you're seeing most, more recently, uh, in the last four or five years, uh, companies like Intellectual Ventures and hedge funds who are acquiring large volumes of these trash patents and using them to extract hundreds of millions of dollars from companies. Mm -hmm. They're benefiting. They may be the biggest benef beneficiaries. You know, there's a lot of bad press in the last few years about the harm that's caused by software patents, and we think that's had a political influence on the PTO to get them to uh, slow down their issuance and start rejecting them. That's what's resulted in the Bilski case. Well, the biggest first bad press story was the BlackBerry patents, where all the congressional representatives have their blackberries and there is a company called NTP that sued the manufacturer of blackberries saying that all blackberries infringed its patent. Well, NTP was this company which is just a one-person holding company. They didn't make any products or services themselves. And so, you know, this got a lot of attention. It was in the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post and and congresspersons were really upset that they may lose their blackberries and they may not be able to communicate efficiently. And so that caused a lot of attention. Then you had all these patents on like banking methods and imaging for checks that those patent holders have been asserting against the banking industry and the banking industry has a lot of influence on Capitol Hill and so they've been going down there and saying look these types of patents are causing us lots of harm. Then you add into that the whole patent troll phenomenon in the Eastern District of Texas with small patent holders suing large IT companies like Google and Microsoft and uh, 
IBM and Hewlett Packard and all these companies also have legislative influence and they've said you know these types of patents are causing real harm to our business they're costing us jobs they're increasing the price of products and services that we offer to our customers and you need to do something about it the, the, the situation we find ourselves in is that the, the lower court the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit is essentially a court for patents, for hearing patent cases. And this is the first time that the Supreme Court has um, taken up uh, that scope of patentability. And specifically, this, this test that was implemented by the lower court does talk to software patents. And so there's basically a 20 year history of software patents being granted due to the, the, the lower court. And so we are hoping that the Supreme Court will clear up the mess that the lower courts created and re-stamp its authority, which basically said that you cannot have software patents. When you saw the arguments that were brought by Bilski's lawyer, uh, the patent bar is, in some sense, an organized lobby. And a uh, expansive subject matter that's available to be patented is in their interests. Um, and it's clear that that was frustrating to some of the justices. Some of them were frustrated by how expansive patentable subject matter has become. I mean, they seem, they seem, they much, they seem somewhat dismissive of the idea that you could patent this particular idea. I think that people have a hard time getting over the idea that you could get a patent on hedging commodity risk. But if you actually look at the claims and look what's in there, it is a process, and it's no different than any other process. It just may be that it's not the way that they've thought of patent law in the past. We were encouraged by, by the comments by the justices which, which showed that they were skeptical and which suggested that they understood that software is little more than a series of steps uh, that could be written out as a mathematical formula or written out on a piece of paper or, as was mentioned by one of the justices, typed out on a typewriter. Software patents on a general purpose computer have never been explicitly endorsed by this court. And this court has also shown no compunction about reversing rules that have held for a very long time. They clearly thought that the petitioners here were trying to get a patent on something very basic, some basic forms of human activity.